Hey everybody, so I received an email from a student at the New York City Long Island University majoring in speech language pathology. This is going to be a tongue twister, I can tell already. First question, so what is your experience with speech-language pathology? Speech-language pathology assessed my swallowing reflex and, um, and my ability to speak um, and coached me through different um, aspects. For me, mostly speech-language pathology was focused on swallowing. Um, my experience was... Uh, was hard. I didn't eat, walk, or talk for months. And out of all those things, the hardest thing was not being able to eat. And the person who held the keys um, to whether I was able to eat or not was the speech language pathologist. So I would have barium swallow tests done. I would uh, do swallowing exercises. Um, and I would gargle, which I later found out stimulates the vagus nerve in the brain, which improves digestion and other autonomic functions. As far as speech therapy goes, music was a huge motivator for me. And so, I, I mean, I didn't eat, walk, or talk for months. My wrist was stuck like this. And I worked really hard to lift my wrist. And as soon as I could wrap it around a guitar, that's what I did. So I found a voice coach that was also an SLP. And I learned how to bring the resonance of my voice back up out of my throat into my face. That was huge. And that's a big, uh, a big thing with, with theater. Question two. What kind of therapy did you receive after your tracheal surgery? Um, yeah, I had, I had a tracheal resection done. So basically they slit my throat, they went in, they sawed my trachea in two spots, took out the middle piece and sewed the two ends back together. And that's what I'm breathing with now. Um, they slit my throat to save my life. So yeah, speech therapy wasn't a big deal after this. It was more about allowing the surgery to heal. Interestingly, I had visiting nurse service of New York send different therapies, nurses, and other practitioners to my apartment and to give me home therapy. Um, but the speech language pathologist didn't like her. There are speech language pathologists that can be your best friend or your worst enemy. And it's not about telling somebody they can eat when they can't but it's about not being overly cautious and allowing them to progress. Um, if swallowing is not the main issue, if the mechanisms that um, are happening in the pharynx are still intact and it's rather a neurological condition, it can most likely be rehabilitated unless the spinal injury or a uh, brainstem injury. I digress. All right, question three. So after your surgery, you were breathing on your own without a tube. What was that experience like? For the months prior, I was breathing through a tracheotomy tube. And, uh, you know, my, my whole sinuses were, were bypassed, basically. So I wasn't able to breathe through my nose for, for months. So I woke up in the recovery room after the tracheal resection and I had no idea. The last thing I remembered, I don't even know what the last thing I remembered was. But now when I think back, the last thing was me counting down, you know, 100, 99, 98. That's what I remember there. So I woke up in a recovery room. It was pretty dark and I didn't even know if I had the surgery yet. I was like, I mean, I felt padding there and stuff. And I'm like, am I prepped? What's going on? 
And then I was like, I know how I can find out. Breathe through your nose. And so I did. Inhaled through my nose and uh, it smelled like sickness and decay and formaldehyde and it was so good. It was the smell of regaining my senses. I like question four. It recognizes that I don't think we ever fully recover from a traumatic injury. I mean, we, we are changed. Um, somebody once said, you're not the same person who went into the storm as the person who came out. The point of that is that an event changes you and it's okay. You know, for example, I can't run. I can't really dribble a ball with my left hand. I dance really funny. Um, I, I am mistaken for being intoxicated regularly. But you know what? It's okay. I, I accept that and I move with that. But that doesn't mean I'm 100% or I'm back to the person I was before. I mean, personality-wise, I'm the same person, but I have grown. I have changed, and that's okay. Five, what was the hardest part of your journey? During the times when I was hospitalized, the worst out of all my disabilities, not being able to walk, not being able to talk, not being able to do fine motor tasks with my left hand. But the worst was not being able to eat or drink. That was the worst. I mean, when you haven't eaten anything conventionally in months, primal instincts override rationality. I was, I was angry. I, w I was the definition of hangry. But once I got out of the acute stages, when I got out of the hospital, when I was able to eat again, the hardest part for me was redefining my life, was rebuilding my life, was reinventing who I was, who I was going to be, and doing it with my new limited capabilities. Question six, you said your family had a hard time. What advice can you give other families that are going through a similar situation as yours? And what advice can you give us health professionals in order to support them, please? Okay, three-parter. Um, part one, yes, my family had a hard time. Um, we're talking about the emotional, the uh, financial, um, the, uh, how do I put this? Just handling, uh, other people's emotions, handling the bureaucratic issues, um, handling, uh, the nurses and healthcare professionals and building a rapport with them. Um, it's not easy. So, so, um, yeah, it was a hard time, but I must say my family did amazingly well. Um, my mom made friends with with the uh, with the healthcare team that was taking care of me. Um, she really created the personal connection between her and the healthcare providers, so that they could see that this patient mattered. Um, when it comes to supporting, uh, families in this situation, I think the biggest thing is compassion, um, and empathy, you know, hearing their pain and listening. Um, now I recognize that many healthcare providers don't have the time to, uh, to, to spend with 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 patients and their loved ones and supporters but it makes a world of difference all right question seven do you still receive therapy and if so do you still see improvements 
Yeah, I do still do therapy. And, um, I mean, vision therapy I go to regularly. Uh, speech therapy I go to as well. Um, do I see improvements? I think at this point it's more of a maintenance thing. But, uh, you know, I'm with me every day, so I don't notice that many improvements. But every once in a while, I won't see somebody for a very long time. And then I'll talk to them and they'll be like, man, you're sounding so much better. So I think I am making, making uh, improvements. And it's like this, you know, you make a lot of improvements at first. It's kind of like, you know, it's like people say with a diet. It's those last few pounds that are really hard to lose. You seem to have a very positive mindset, but what about others that don't see the light at the end of the tunnel? How should we assist them? This is a difficult question to answer. It's about motivating someone. It's about showing them the light so that they are motivated. How do we do that? Well, it's a million dollar question. You know, the number one determinant that I've seen for whether somebody has successful recovery or not is their support system, is their family, their friends, the people that they that are visiting, the people that care, the collective, um, not to sound woo-woo, but the collective intention towards that person. If you could bottle that stuff, Man, it would be worth millions. All right, the last question. So it says, an amazing aspect of recovery is the fact that you started to sing. Not being able to breathe on your own or to talk for such a long time, then going through such excruciating pain to get this part of your life back. How did you even think about singing? Truth is, singing was all I could think about. And if I could, I'd drop a mic. Thanks, guys. That's all I got for you today. Now go out and be excellent speech-language pathologists.